Yakuza 3, a game that would send the series into the next generation of consoles and attempt to change things for the better. Its story, though at first glance odd and unassuming, would teach some of the best lessons of the series, leave that classic heartwarming impact, and introduce tons of twists and turns you wouldn't expect. Today, I want to dive deep into Yakuza 3, taking a look at gameplay, mechanics, and everything in between. If you haven't seen my other videos on the Yakuza series, I highly suggest you go check them out because they will provide a lot of needed context when looking at this entry. If you like the video, leave a like and subscribe because it really helps out the channel. You can also support me over on Patreon where I upload extended versions of my full retrospectives and monthly updates. Spoilers for Yakuza 3. Hey dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I'd like to talk about Yakuza 3. Yakuza 3 was partially revealed in June 2009 by Daisuke Tomoda, the visual artist and character design leader. Daisuke Sato would replace Ryuti Ueda as director for the next entry. For the third game in the series, the RGG team put characters first, designing 110 high polygon characters and 250 minor character models totaling 360 character models overall. Yakuza 3 introduces a new setting, Okinawa. The in-game version was modeled in some parts after the Tokashiki Island and Tokashiku Beach. The team wanted to take the story in a new direction and force Kiryu to deal with different problems than punching bad guys, problems that normal everyday people have to face. With the next generation, RGG introduced a new engine, greatly improving graphics and changing combat. This would be one of the biggest evolutions in the series and would pave the way for the technical improvements that the series would make moving forward. Yakuza 3 was released officially on February 26, 2009 for the PlayStation 3. Two things to note before we get into it. First, I'd like to briefly explain the structure of this retrospective. Yakuza is known for its side content, a plethora of mini-games, sub-stories, and just general things to find and do. It's almost as much a part of the game as the story is. Because of this, each time I go through a Yakuza game, I will first take you through the story, inspecting its narrative heavily and its gameplay, and then venturing back to talk about Yakuza's distractions, which are a world and story of their own. Second is the version of Yakuza 3 that I'll be playing. Yakuza 3 was originally released for the PlayStation 3, but a remastered collection of Yakuza 3, 4, and 5 was released worldwide on August 20th, 2019 for the PlayStation 4, and was later released for PC and Xbox One. Because of its accessibility and graphical remaster, I'll be playing the PlayStation 4 version of the game. Yakuza 3 was greatly changed for the English market, and some content was originally cut in the Western PlayStation 3 release. Substories were removed, Hostess Clubs and Hostess Maker was removed, and four minigames were taken out. With the remastered version, we can play the English release and still experience all of this content. There was also some strange localizations for the first three games that I haven't really talked about yet. The oddest one was Kazuma. In the Western release for the first four Yakuza games, Kazuma's name was changed from Shintaro Kazuma to Shintaro Fuma. This was assumingly to prevent any confusion with Western audiences between Shintaro Kazuma and Kazuma Kiryu. I always found this pretty odd that his name was completely different, but now we can get consistency through this whole series. Yakuza 3 begins with Haruka and Kiryu enjoying a day on the beaches of Okinawa. Kiryu catches a fish and takes it back to the orphanage that he now runs, Morning Glory. Likia, Kiryu's new friend, shows up and says the boss has been shot. 
Daigo is then being driven in a limo, now the sixth chairman of the Tojo clan. He gets a call about some sort of land deal in Okinawa, but he firmly rejects it, even though it's a tantalizing offer. The reason is because the fourth chairman has his orphanage on that land, and he deserves the clan's best after all he's done. Daigo holds Kiryu in such high regard that he's going out of his way to make sure no one else goes behind his back and gets this deal. He'll do anything to give Kiryu the peace he deserves. This is one of the reasons I love Daigo so much. He respects Kiryu and puts him up on high. He's also respectful and wants Kiryu to be happy because he's a man of great power and he's done so much that peace is exactly what he deserves. When Daigo arrives back at the headquarters, someone is there to see him, a dead man. Kazuma-san! Shintaro Kazuma, in the flesh. He hands Daigo the deed to the land in Okinawa. Kazuma decided to take it for Daigo since he didn't want to go against Kiryu. Because the deal was so lucrative, he felt it necessary to keep the Tojo clan alive and keep people in Daigo's court. Daigo still wants to refuse and the American man that's with Kazuma takes the deed and Kazuma shoots the sixth chairman. Kiryu has arrived at the hospital looking for the boss and he's in critical condition. Saki, another young girl, was there at the time of the boss's shooting, and she drew a sketch of the man that did it. Kiryu sees the face of his father, the man that raised him, and gave him the life he knows, and he can't believe it. We jump back at this point to right after the events of Yakuza 2. Kiryu and Haruka are paying their respects to Torada's grave, and Kaoru shows up. She tells the two that she got a job in the United States and is leaving the country. This story beat is really odd, and seems like a way to just move on to new events, leaving the last game in the past and making each game its own little contained story. But they really do Kaoru dirty in this entry. They just entirely sweep her under the rug and push her out of the way so that they can move on. It's so strange. Sudo and Date are watching from the bushes, and Sudo says that he's been promoted. Most of the people involved in the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department have been to keep them quiet about the corruption involved. Date quit the force because of disappointment in the higher-ups. Sudo thinks that Kamurocho is going to fall back to its own ways with Kiryu gone and away from the Tojo clan. As Kiryu is giving his goodbyes to Kaoru, he decides he needs to say goodbye to everyone else and secure someone to watch over Daigo, since he predicts he'll become the sixth chairman. That specific someone is an old mad dog that Daigo is going to have to tame. First, Kiryu has to head over to Stardust and say goodbye to Yuya. Him and the workers are making an effort to get the place cleaned up after the Go Ryu clan tore it up. Kazuki is still recovering at the clinic and promises to bring the boys out to Okinawa to visit. Kiryu explains to Emoto why he needs to talk to Majima. Basically, Majima will be able to bring the other members in line, and they'll respect him, or at least listen to him. He asks to leave Haruka there while he talks to Majima. On the way, Kiryu is shaken down by some thugs, and they end up being members of the Kazuma family, but they don't realize who he is. Once they understand they're talking to the former fourth chairman of the Tojo clan, they make their apologies and run. We find Nishida in front of the Millennium Tower, and he says that the boss is on the roof, contemplating. Turns out, Majima is a real softy, but he wouldn't want anyone to know that. We find him on the roof, and Kiryu suggests that he watch over Daigo while he's gone. Ah, <laughs> Majima thinks that requesting that he go back to the Tojo clan is ludicrous. Kiryu tells him that in protecting Daigo, he'll get to fight even more people, anyone that's against the Tojo clan, but there's only one person that Majima wants to fight right now, and it's Kiryu. We have our first boss fight of the game, and I think it's apparent that we first go over the battle system. 
Yakuza 3 has an interesting change and adjustment in regards to the combat. The upgrade system is very similar to the previous two entries, in their original states at least. There are four categories that we can upgrade, soul, tech, body, and heat. Upgrading one of these categories requires experience that we gain through completing main story missions, fighting enemies, eating food, and finishing sub-stories. Once we upgrade one of the categories, we can gain a new ability, a general stat upgrade, or both. This could be anything from doing more damage with throws to increasing our health. It's a very simple system and was the way that Yakuza 1 and 2 did it, not looking at the Kiwami remakes. The combat, however, is pretty different from the first two. The largest thing I think it does is upgrade the smoothness of the system overall. Fighting enemies is a little more butter than previous. We can target individuals and switch back and forth a little bit better than we could, and hitting bad guys feels, overall, better. The basic controls are the same, light attack and heavy attack, mixing the two to pull off finishing blows, which are the bread and butter of our attacks. We can grab enemies and throw them, and in certain situations, complete heat actions, which will see Kiryu thrashing an enemy in a particularly vicious manner, and dealing quite a bit of damage. We can block and sidestep to either negate damage or avoid it. There's a big difference with Yakuza 3 though, and one that a lot of people notice when they start playing the game, and that's blocking. Enemies in Yakuza 3 block a lot, it's their main go-to when you start attacking. Instead of just getting hit in the face all the time, they put their dukes up and try to brush off some of that damage. This is a natural progression of the system, and I think was a way that the team could make the AI a little more realistic in their battles against Kiryu. This is also something that a lot of people have complained about when playing this game. Look up anything related to Yakuza 3 and eventually you'll see someone complaining about blocking in this entry. Now, in the first five hours of playing the game, I would have agreed. Every enemy in this game seems to be able to effectively block every attack and compared to the previous games, it seems like it's a lot less satisfying. It's like if you're a dog and every morning your owner gives you a treat, but all of a sudden one day he makes you jump, sit, give him paw, roll over, and run around the block for that same treat. Same reward, but way more work than you're used to putting in. It just doesn't feel like it's worth it when last week you were getting the same treat for half the work. I totally understand this argument, but if you actually stick with Yakuza 3, you realize that it isn't like that at all. It does require a little more work, but Yakuza 3's battle system is a lot more technical. We aren't bashing our way through the enemy's guard to get to their face, we have to work around it. If we keep hitting them, we get bashed back and punished for it. We can block their attacks, but that only works for so long. We can actually normally get one or two hits off before they block, but this isn't reliable because every boss battle would result in a 40 minute slugfest. So what's the one thing left to do? Play defense and wait for the attack, sidestep and get behind the enemy. After I understood what the game was doing, it made all of the sense in the world. You're about to see here pretty soon that not only does Yakuza 3 greatly change the gameplay, it greatly changes the story beats that it presents as well, and the two are intertwined. The gameplay is just a reflection of the story itself, which is a genius choice, and we'll see why here in a bit. Majima is kind of our first odd boss battle here at the beginning. We're still working out the kinks of the new system, and it's normal to kind of get trashed by Majima a little. We eventually take him down, charging up at the end of the battle to deliver our finisher on him. The two have a conversation after expending all of their energy. <laughs> As usual, Majima has some insight into the situation. He thinks Daigo is a little naive to be in such a high position. Characters like these always entice me for some reason. The ones that are far too honorable for their own good. The ones that exist in a world of treachery and deceit, but still try to rise above it all and do good. That's Daigo, and it's what Majima is trying to express here, because usually those characters end up dead. Kiryu thinks he's just young and decides to head out, officially handing the Tojo clan off to Majima. Back at Morning Glory Orphanage, Kiryu is trying to make curry for the children. 
Haruka is an instrumental part of the operation here, as we can see in this first scene of the new chapter. Not only does Kiryu have to do a lot of the work, but Haruka helps him by managing the kids and vice versa. Izumi hasn't shown up for dinner and Kiryu tracks her down to the beach. Kiryu is the head of morning glory now, that's his entire life, and we're about to probe pretty deep into that for the next few hours of gameplay. It's not exactly what we're used to when playing a Yakuza entry, but it's an incredibly interesting and ambitious switch up. The tone and style change is one that's unexpected, but also well reflected in the gameplay, atmosphere, tone, and general character development that the series would take over time. Izumi is being bullied at school for not having parents. She's incredibly distraught and can't seem to get it off her mind. Eventually, Kiryu tells her that he and the kids at Morning Glory are her family. That's everything she needs. This message might seem a little surface level and kitschy, but Kiryu takes it a level deeper by telling her that the kids at school don't even understand what they're doing when they're making fun of her. They just can't imagine life any other way, and they just don't get how other people live. This level of empathy adds an entire layer to the moral message that the game is trying to portray. It's also a reflection of Kiryu himself. Growing up in an orphanage without parents, he probably had to deal with the same feelings. Eventually, Haruka comes down to the beach and retrieves Kiryu and Izumi, and the entire family have dinner together. The next morning, the family receives an eviction notice and sees some men parked out front of the orphanage, looking menacing. As Kiryu tries to confront the men, they drive away. They're from the Ryudo family, local to Okinawa, and Kiryu decides to pay them a visit. To do this, we have to head downtown to Ryukyu. This is the new city that we get access to in Yakuza 3. We'll also be heading back to Kamurocho, but a large portion of our game will take place here. This area is based on Makishi, a public market area of Naha, the capital of Okinawa Prefecture. Certain areas in Ryukyu, like the Karayushi Arcade, the Makishi Public Market, and Kokusai Street, are portrayed in the game. The area is much less hustle and bustle than Kamurocho or Sotenbori and its seaside location is much more prominent in its culture and style. It's not as big as Sotenbori or Kamurocho either, but that doesn't mean there isn't anything to do. We'll get into all that later. For now, Kiryu needs to find the Ryudo family offices. He finds the two men eating popsicles down by the local Popo store. These two are Likia and Mikio, and Likia is pretty set on fighting Kiryu. He has his own Yakuza tattoo, a viper on his back, the fighting spirit of the island of Okinawa. We have to battle Likia here, and he's the first full example of the blocking and dodging that this game presents. All of our basic attacks and finishers to the front, he just shirks off. We can get a couple through, but the easiest way to damage him is to get around. Kiryu shows them who's boss, and they have to take him to their boss. Before we leave, Rikia tells us that his back tattoo has gone unfinished. Its eyes are still blank. He needs an artist to finish the work because his passed away before he could get the job done. We get stopped by a few people on the way to the Ryudo offices, seeing that Rikia is an important part of the Okinawa community, even though they give him a lot of grief. The two men direct Kiryu to the offices and invite him in, giving him a lot more respect than before now that he's shown his true power. We see the girl from the flash forward, the one that drew the picture of Kazuma. Saki is her name. She's living with the Ryudo family boss, Nakahara. Nakahara says the Ryudo family owns the land that Morning Glory is on, and they have some buyers that are interested. They need the money and they want to spot Kiryu some cash so he can move the kids and himself somewhere else, but Kiryu refuses. Kiryu tells him that he should do what he can to help the island, not evict children for money, and Nakahata wants to fight. Kiryu will fight him if need be, but he won't be holding anything back. We learn from a news program that there's a large power struggle on the island of Okinawa. On one side of that struggle is Ryuzo Tamiya, who wants to increase the island's defense and military capabilities. The other side of that struggle is Yoshinobu Suzuki, who wants to focus the island more on tourism. 
Tamiya is being met by protesters who vehemently disagree with the military expansion plan, and Suzuki is being met with praise from businessmen and financiers. After Kiryu is done with his nightly dad news time, he goes to see Shiro, because Haruka says something is wrong with him. He's sulking in the corner, and he's pretty resistant to giving Kiryu any information. We have to ask the other kids what's going on with Shiro. Most of them don't know anything, but eventually, Taichi says that he's been getting bullied at school. Kiryu calls his teacher to speak to him about the issue, but he's not very receptive, and blames most of it on the fact that Shido is being raised at the orphanage. Shido says he already talked to the teacher, but he wasn't help at all. We find out from Taichi that the kid that's been bullying Shido is the son of the teacher, which explains why he's been protecting him. When Shiro tried to tell on Yoshinori, he said he'd have Morning Glory shut down. Shiro was then forced into silence for this, and he's been backed into a corner. He feels like he can't even talk to anyone about what's going on because he doesn't want to affect the other kids and Kiryu. There's a man that's pretty famous around Okinawa named Akasaka. He's a counselor in the local government, and the teacher at the kid's school is friends with him. Shiro thinks he'd use this to get Morning Glory shut down. Kiryu thinks it would be a good idea to get friendly with Akasaka instead of going to the teacher, and one of his neighbors tells him that he's a big golfer. Kiryu heads to the local golf club and can't get in without a membership. Quite serendipitously, Akasaka is there and invites him in for some rounds of golf. Kiryu gets to know him over the next few holes, and he finds out about the orphanage. He thinks what Kiryu is doing is fantastic and wants to come visit sometime, and by sometime, he means later that day. While Akasaka is getting his tour, Shido comes home bloodied and bruised. He decided to stand up for himself after Kiryu's inspiring words. Hashimoto and his son come to berate Kiryu for what Shido did, and Akasaka sees this facade that Hashimoto has been putting on. The teacher is forced to leave before making himself look like a fool in front of the counselor, and Morning Glory definitely isn't getting shut down anytime soon. That isn't the end of the quarrels at Morning Glory, because right after this, Ayako is having trouble paying back Taichi after she borrowed some money from him. She tells Kiryu that it was stolen and he wants to get to the bottom of things. Kiryu calls all the children to a house meeting and no one seems to want to fess up. After the meeting, Eddie is seen going through some bags and Kiryu heads to talk to her on the beach. Eddie didn't have enough money to go to the movies with her friends and she felt like she had to steal to be able to spend time with them. The kids know that money is tight around the orphanage so they never invite her to do things. Kiryu tells her that she's done the right thing by confessing and owning up to what she did. The next step is to apologize. The kids make up and Ayako forgives Eddie. Kiryu tells the rest of the kids that Eddie just found the money outside, that Ayako must have dropped it, as to avoid the children looking at her any differently. Rikia is back at the orphanage, and he's not there to talk about the land. This time, it's about Saki, the girl that Nakahara takes care of. She's not his biological daughter, but he treats her like one. When she was younger, her dad gambled all of their money and was an avid drinker. He abused the mother and eventually took his own life. Saki witnessed this, and after her father's death, her mother began running around with men all over town. Nakahata took Saki in to give her a better life, and her mother hasn't seemed to care, except that now she's back in town. Saki is missing, and Nakahata believes that her mother came to take her back, to pull her back down into that terrible, traumatic life she was living. Rikia wants Kiryu to help them find her because the boss hasn't been in good spirits since she's been gone. Rikia keeps calling Kiryu Anaki, meaning older brother or superior, and Kiryu doesn't like it. He doesn't want the kids to think that he's involved with the Yakuza again, but time is of the essence and they have to go. When they get back to the Ryudo offices, the boss has been drinking his sorrows away and he's trashed the place. He thinks that Saki wants to be back with her mother and that she must not love him anymore. Kiryu tells him it's natural for a child to want her mother and that he's going to go help Saki because she needs someone right now and he can't let her down. He takes Rikia with him and they find out that Saki and her mother have been spotted around the Tamashiro family offices. 
Tetsuo Tamashiro has them holed up inside, taking Saki's mother as his newest flame. Flame is probably a bit of a strong word, because when we make our way through the offices, the first thing he does is cast her to the side. He's just using them as bargaining chips against the Ryudo family. We have to fight Tetsuo to free the girls, and he's a bit of a pain. The easy part of this battle is that his attacks are pretty telegraphed. Like every other boss though, he blocks pretty good and getting through his defense is just a matter of being quicker than him and striking when the moment presents itself. Through the battle, Tetsuo will throw daggers at us and switch to using brass knuckles at a certain point. Nakahata shows up after we defeat the man, and Saki's mother goes into a fit about how she never wanted the girl in the first place. <laughs> She's been completely dejected by her family at this point. Her father, never caring for her, is now dead, and her mother only cares about the men she's with, not the girls she has to take care of. Nakahara is the only thing she has in this world, and she's the only thing he has. When Nakahata opens her sketchbook, it's pictures that she's drawn of him, thanking him for protecting her. <laughs> Nakahata gets his daughter back, and Saki gets to go home to her true father. I can imagine that Kiryu probably had some memories flooding back of himself as a child, looking up to Kazuma at this point. Nakahata is incredibly appreciative of Kiryu, and asks him to be his sworn brother, as a sign of respect. As they begin the process, Daigo shows up with Shoyo Toma. He reveals that they were using the Tamashiro family to acquire the Okinawa land for Suzuki, but they've gone overboard. The military bill and the tourism bill seem like they're at odds, but Daigo says that they actually need each other to pass. They're linked. Toma, a man working for the Ministry of Defense, wants to get the tourism bill passed because he believes it's better for Okinawa than the military defense bill. The two want to use methods working with the locals to get things done, not threatening them. Daigo decides to back off, though. He promises Kiryu that as long as he's chairman of the Tojo clan, the orphanage will be safe. He says he wouldn't want to incur Kiryu's wrath, and that Toma can get the bill passed when he becomes prime minister. Nakahata realizes that Kiryu is the fourth chairman of the Tojo clan, and they become sworn brothers, finishing their process. We jump ahead one year later, to the present day, March 2009. Kiryu and the group are in the hospital, just finding out that the man who shot Nakahata is Kazuma, or someone who looks like him. Kashiwagi calls and tells Kiryu that Daigo has also been shot by the same man. Kiryu tells Rikia and Mikio who the man in the picture is. Nakahata is stable, but is still in critical condition. He might be able to pull through, but it's all up to time. Haruka and Kiryu are on the beach, and she's wondering if he's going to leave for Kamurocho. He's still deciding, and Likia wants to go with him. His passion and determination convince Kiryu that he has to go to Kamurocho so that they don't lose the orphanage. But he can't take Likia. He just isn't ready, and Kamurocho is too dangerous. The next morning, Mikio and the boys are chasing down some stray dog that's been running around the streets. He was abandoned by his owner, but Izumi seems to have an attachment to the dog, and she wants to find him. Kiryu finds the dog running around Ryuku, and we have our first chase sequence. This one isn't a full chase sequence, because we can't and shouldn't tackle the dog. The third Yakuza entry features many different chases, and during these we can use R2 to dash, spending some of Kiryu's stamina bar to catch up to our chasee. 
In some circumstances, we can tackle them to get rid of some of their stamina bar, and once it's depleted, they'll fall down. It's a pretty simple little system, but I think it's used effectively in this entry. The team would fully flesh it out in some of the later spin-off games, Judgment, but we'll get there. After catching the dog, he's still apprehensive and won't warm up to Izumi. She reveals that she had a dog that looks just like this one when she was younger, but she had to give it away. Izumi asks Kiryu to get something that the dog would like, and this can actually go slightly different. We can choose dog food and just go buy it from the store, but I chose bones. This caused me to run to multiple different stores throughout Ryukyu and eventually come back after realizing no one sold bones. She wants us to get a ball for him to play with and we have to head back to Morning Glory to borrow one from Koji. After a while, Mame, the dog, begins warming up to Izumi. Some Tamashiro men come along and hit Mikio, but he protects the dog in the process. Izumi then wants him to build a doghouse for Mame, and he reluctantly agrees. I think there's something important that needs to be talked about here in regards to Yakuza 3. Normally, on an older game, I wouldn't really comment on the graphical fidelity. I think saying that an older game's graphics look bad is just kind of pointless because you're always looking at it through the lens of the current graphics of the day, but Yakuza 3 has kind of a special quality about it. Obviously, this jump to the PlayStation 3 was a big change for the series overall, and I think it would cement some of the characters' signature looks moving forward. They turned from these polygonal PS2 models to these living, breathing characters. That being said, they look very strange, and I think that Yakuza 3 has this odd, uncanny valley feeling to it. It's not quite to the level of fidelity that 5, 6, 0, the Kiwamis, and 7 would be, but it's definitely ahead of Yakuza 2. It acts as this strange bridge between the games, when they're just fleshing out the character models into what they would be, but they're not advanced enough to look completely right. I say that all with the great affection that I have for Yakuza 3 and its world. It has that distinct PS3 aesthetic to it, and almost makes the cities of Kamurocho and especially Okinawa a lot more comforting than any of the high-fidelity versions of the games do. Maybe it's personal bias as I had the PlayStation 3 at a very formative time in my life, but I just can't get enough of the Yakuza 3 aesthetic. It's so cozy. When Kiryu gets back to Morning Glory, Mitsuo is trying to ask Riona out on a date. She doesn't want to go to the movies with him. Rikia and Kiryu seem to think that it's because of his fashion, and they have a contest to see who can dress him better. Kiryu heads downtown to pick out some clothes, and the two offer to get Mitsuo dripped out. When he gets dressed up, he goes to ask Riona if she wants to go to the movies again, and she says no, again, and in a pretty harsh way. Mitsuo thinks that she likes Okada from their class because he's rich. He tells him not to give up, but as Kiryu is about to leave, Riona stops him. She wants him to teach her how to make Dudu Wakashi. Haruka helps her out after Kiryu leaves, and Riona drops the bomb about why she doesn't want to date Mitsuo, and it's because of his skin color. Taichi says he went downtown by himself, and Kiryu follows him. Riona is hanging out with some kids who want to go swimming, but they start to make fun of her because of a scar she has on her arm. Mitsuo steps in and stands up for Riona, because these kids shouldn't be making fun of her because of the way she looks. ね。ね。Mitsuo never finds out about why Riona didn't like him, but Riona knows. She realizes what she was doing was wrong. Now, I know it seems like there's a lot of non-Yakuza things going on right now, and there are. The first third of Yakuza 3 isn't really a Yakuza game, in that it's not really about the Yakuza. You're probably also saying to yourself, why do I care about these kids? I care about Kiryu. Well, Dad, this story is the most Kiryu story that Yakuza could tell at this point in time. 
First off, dealing with these kids teaches them, us, and most importantly, Kiryu himself, lessons. To be honest about your problems, to stand up to people who try to put you down, and to not push others out because they're different than you. Kiryu is growing as a person. In the last game, he was trying to learn how to not punch his problems, and spoiler alert, this is how he does that. It's also part of Kiryu's life itself, we're seeing the environment in which the Dragon of Dojima grew up. It's not the same exact one, and we don't see child Kiryu, but we're seeing how he learned these same lessons so long ago. I'm sure he had to deal with kids at school telling him he wasn't worth it because his parents were gone, and I can see Kazuma now saying the same things to him that he said to Izumi. I say this because I want you to know how these scenes and stories are integral to Kiryu's story moving forward. They develop his humanity, and that alone affects the Yakuza itself. The kids are playing baseball on the beach, and they invite one of the other children over to play with him. He seems pretty hesitant and has never played baseball before, but the Morning Glory kids are incredibly inviting and they make him feel at home. He takes a fall, and that's when things go south. His mother arrives and seems to have been sheltering Akira. Hashimoto, the teacher from before, rushes over to butt his stupid fucking head into the mix, and the two start talking about how terrible all the orphanage kids are. This illustrates an interesting concept, that most of the torment the kids at school are receiving probably originates from the parents stereotyping the children in the first place. Akira eventually wakes up and says that playing baseball with the kids was the most fun he's had in a while, and he stands up to his mom. He tells his mom that he's been getting bullied by Hashimoto's son, and she loses it on him. Kiryu finally gets ready to depart for Kamurocho, and tells the whole group that he's leaving. Saki is going to stay at the orphanage while he's gone, Nakahata still recovering. The group accepts her with open arms, and Kiryu heads out on a plane. We see a few different scenes here and realize that a power vacuum has begun to form after Daigo has been shot. Kashiwagi is setting up a meeting with some mystery member of the Yakuza, and an important one at that. In Chinatown, another mystery member of the Yakuza receives the same call while he's interrogating a Chinese chef, and he ends up blowing up the place on the way out. Suyoshi Kanda is also being called and is ready to declare all-out war on the Tojo clan. I think something Yakuza 3 immediately does better than 2 is flesh out the newer, upper ranks of the Tojo clan. In the previous game, it didn't really feel like we knew what the hierarchy was after the events of the first game, and they left that kind of untold. He calls Mine, the Yakuza captain from before, and he's asking him to bring a billion yen. Kiryu arrives back in Kamurocho, and something is happening at Stardust. Hasebe, of the Nishiki family, is trying to buy Stardust for a month. He needs a base for the upcoming war they're about to set in Kamurocho, but Yuya and Kazuki won't accept. We battle him, and the fight gets drawn out pretty long, due to Hasebe being pretty hard to hit. He uses a sword most of the time, and can down us and do big damage. Once he's down, he says that Kashiwagi is going to die. Kiryu talks to Kazuki after the club has settled, and says that the Nishiki family has been changing the Tojo clan, and Kamurocho. They've been taking things too far, over the top with bribes and unsavory behavior. Everyone believes that a full Yakuza war is about to commence, and that's what the Nishiki family wants Stardust for. Kashiwagi calls and tells Kiryu to come to the Millennium Tower. Before we leave, Kazuki tells us there are some shady characters around town, men in black, foreigners looking to track down Daigo. On the way to the tower, we're surrounded by these very men. Our mini-boss battle with mysterious foreigner A is pretty tough. He uses some wild kick attacks that aren't easily spotted. Eventually, we take him down and the men retreat as they hear sirens. We find Kashiwagi in his office at the Millennium Tower. He brings us up to speed and says all of the families decided to go their separate ways and pursue their own interests. They haven't separated the Tojo clan, but the families sure are splintered in the absence of Daigo. None of them can agree on anything, and the main new members we need to focus on are Hamazaki, patriarch of the Hamazaki family, Suyoshi Kanda, patriarch of the Nishiki family, and Yoshitaka Mine, chairman of the Hakuho clan. These are the upper ranks of the Tojo clan now. None of them can agree on what to do. Some want to get revenge for Daigo, some want to bring the families together. 
Majima says he doesn't care what they do, but if they think they're going for his turf, it'll mean their lives. The two agree that because the shootings were so close together, there's no way Nakahata and Daigo could have been shot by the same man. At this point, the power goes out and a helicopter shows up, firing rounds into the office. Kashiwagi is hit, and as he's bleeding out, he says there's a traitor in the Tojo clan, someone working with the man in the picture. Kiryu heads downstairs, trying to escape the tower, but the police see the blood on his shirt and suspect him. A chase ensues, and we have to run this time, jumping over cars, barrels, and making sure to avoid getting grabbed by the police. These sequences add a certain intensity to the story of Yakuza. At the end of the chase, we find a familiar face, Date. He tells us to follow him through the city, and he gets us around the police blockades, avoiding their sight. He takes us to New Serena, the revised version of the bar that Kiryu used to call home. A new mama is running the place now. If you're not aware, in Japan, a mama, or sometimes mama-san, is a woman that's in charge of running a bar, club, or even all the way back to geisha houses. Date reveals that he's working for the newspaper now. Date catches us up to speed on the three new players in the Tojo clan. Kanda, the third patriarch of the Nishiki family, was tossed in jail on assault charges. He expanded his turf by brute force after getting out of prison, and he quickly took most of the Kazuma family's territory. If there's one thing he cares about, it's power. Date thinks the chances of him being Kashiwagi's shooter are high. Next is the chairman of the Hakuho clan, Yoshitaka Mine. He's a rich businessman, most of his money gained from insider trading. He's funneling a ton of that money into the Tojo clan through the Nishiki family. Kanda himself convinced Mine to join the Yakuza. He's separated from Kanda since his own ranks have grown, and he's loyal to the chairman. The last is Go Hamazaki, the patriarch of the Hamazaki family. He's based out of Yokohama and has taken control over the city after the Snake Flower Triad was pushed out. He technically only has 10 men in his employ, and Date thinks he's working with the Chinese mafia behind the scenes. The two think the next step is to find out the traitor in the Tojo clan. At this point, Kiryu gets a call from Likia saying that he's in town. He wants to help find out who shot Nakahara. We have to search all over the city for Likia while he gives us vague explanations and landmarks. Eventually, we find him in the children's park, protecting a woman being harassed by the Nishiki family. We beat them down and they say that they were getting women for Kanda. He has an odd appetite for bringing women back to the office so he can massage them and he likes them thick. He's at a hotel nearby and the two head there. It seems to be some sort of hotel where people go to, um, well, you know, Dad. Rikia and Kiryu have to pretend to be lovers to get in. We track down Kanda and he runs away. We get an odd sequence where we have to track him down to another room, bashing in random doors will see us barging in on all manner of different people. Eventually, we get a hold of Kanda and he runs away again, and again. Finally, we get to his room, and he's swimming in the hot tub, ready to pounce like a shark. He doesn't even give us a chance to talk and starts to attack. Kanda's battle is really well designed because it reflects his character. He doesn't want a fair fight at all, he wants to win. He doesn't last a few seconds without a weapon in his hand because he'll run away and grab something. Halfway through the battle, he showcases his true strength and begins tearing huge concrete plates off the walls and using them to attack us. We perform a ridiculous and hilarious back-breaking finisher move to end the fight. He says he wasn't the one who killed Kashiwagi, it was Hamazaki. He's trying to take control of Kamarocho, he's got an army in Yokohama, and is ready to start a war. Nikia makes his way to the room, and Kanda tries to stab Kiryu in the back, but Kiryu is too fast. He tells Likia to go back to Okinawa because it's too dangerous for him, but he wants revenge. Kiryu lets him stay on the condition that he doesn't go after the man in the sketch on his own. He promises, and the two go to grab a drink. We have the option of taking Likia around the city at this point, and because this content is optional, I would normally consider it for the distraction section, but it's pretty integral in developing Likia's character, so I've elected to include it here as part of the main story. 
He wants to see the city, and we take him to various places around town. Dinner at Komian, out to Don Quixote, and eventually to Utabori, the legendary tattoo artist. Rikia wants him to finish his viper, but he refuses, as he cannot finish another artist's work. Rikia is very upset by this news, and frankly, quite disrespectful to Utabori. Shortly after this, Kiryu and Rikia get into a scuffle with some men on the street. Utabori reconsiders and decides to finish the tattoo for him. This means the world to Likia, now that he has the soul of Okinawa on his back in full. Kiryu and he linked together forever, Utabori Inc. on both of their backs. Likia wants to head to the Millennium Tower, but it's closed, so they spend the last bit of their night in the park. Kiryu tells him about the type of man that Kashiwagi was, and he's thankful that Kiryu did all this for him. Kiryu heads back to New Sedena to fill Date in on what Kanda had to say. At the bar, Kiryu finds a man in the back alley being harassed. This begins another side story that isn't as integral to the main plot, but we will get to it later. We see Hamazaki talking to Majima. He says that Kiryu visited Kanda and Majima is next on the list as a suspect of shooting Daigo, Majima seemingly working with Hamazaki. Back at New Sedena, we find out both the resort and defense bill have been passed, and Majima Construction has been hired to do the work. Kiryu heads to Kamurocho Hills to talk to Majima directly. The place is barren, with only a lone shed in the center. Inside, Kiryu answers a phone, and outside, hundreds of men are placed at Majima's disposal. He asks us to come downstairs and follow him. He takes us to the Colosseum, which he says has been closed down. This whole sequence with Majima is so eerie. We're sure that he's turned at this point. On the Tojo clan, on Kiryu, on everything. But we realize quickly that Majima just wants another fight, and that the Colosseum has not been shut down at all. We have to battle him again, which is pretty similar to the one at the beginning of the game, albeit a little harder with his upgraded health bar. After we beat him, he agrees to give us the information on Hamazaki and the resort. Hamazaki was the one who put Majima in touch with Suzuki to get the work for Majima Construction. Since Daigo left the land deal on the table, Hamazaki scooped it up. Hamazaki was trying to frame Majima and pit him against everyone. Hamazaki isn't only after the resort, though. He's after all of Kamurocho and the Tojo clan. We hear a familiar voice and the platform descends. The florist is back, and he set up shop under Purgatory after he moved out of the Millennium Tower. The florist reveals quite a bit of information. Hamazaki wants to hand the resort deal over to Lao Ka Long, the head of the Snake Flower Triad. Daigo ordered the florist to keep watch over Hamazaki for the past six months, and someone else is involved, the man that looks just like Kazuma. At that point, the Snake Flower Triad begins to invade Kamurocho, looking for Likia. We fight through waves of Triad members weaving through the streets of the city, and eventually track down a few Triad officers, and trace it all the way back to Lao Kalong. He has Likia captured on the roof of an unknown building. Lao Kalong was only involved in all of this to get back at Kiryu. He accepted the deal from Hamazaki just to get revenge on him. We're forced to battle him again, and it's where this whole battle system comes to a head. I would say this was the only truly frustrating fight in the entire game. Lao blocks just about every shot we throw at him, and getting behind him to get hits in is pretty unreliable, only working some of the time. It's pretty rough, and was trying my patience at certain points. It wasn't particularly difficult, it just takes such a long time. The recovery items in this game are so plentiful that you can't really call any battle hard, it's just a matter of how long each one takes. After Lao goes down, he orders his men to execute Rikia. A man shows up and shoots the guards, and eventually Lao in the head, killing him. どうして大悟中原を撃ったんだ。ユーガ。キリュウカズマか。
Ah. Beautiful eyes. Eh? Like I heard from my brother before. Kiryu tells the group what happened, and he tells Rikia to go home and to take care of Morning Glory. Mine calls and says he wants a meeting with him, and he's at Purgatory. Mine says that his organization has been responsible for causing problems and brings them Kanda's head in a briefcase as retribution. We see a flashback to Mine killing Kanda after he had an outburst at his apartment. He says that the Hamazaki family is finished, destroyed overnight, and he will do anything to keep the Tojo clan together. Mine somehow sees himself as the successor to Daigo's legacy, because they both want to see the Tojo clan kept together. The big difference here is that Daigo wouldn't be working in the ways that Mine would. He would go to great lengths to avoid killing members of his own clan. Mine says he has nothing to learn from Kiryu and leaves. The group ponders what just happened, and they all decide to do the work that needs to be done. The florist is going to look into the man that looks like Kazuma, and Date is going to look into Mine. Majima decides that he should take over leadership of the Kazuma family. First, Kiryu has to send Rikia back to Okinawa to make sure he's safe. He gets him a taxi home, and he gets a call from Tamiya, the Minister of Defense. He wants to meet with Kiryu to clear things up and sends a driver to meet him outside of the Millennium Tower. Kiryu decides to bring Date along with him and the two take the car to the Ministry of Defense. When they arrive, Timiya says that their objectives are aligned. He's about to spill the beans on the whole plot, clearing everything up in one fell swoop, so there's a lot of information here. Originally, the Bill of Defense was meant to lure an organization out into the open, one called Black Monday. Black Monday are a black market arms dealer that gained power after the stock market crash of 87. Their leader, Andre Richardson, was believed to be behind the crash. The bill was meant to lure them out and take them down. The defense bill would bring in high-tech weapons and bring out Black Monday to try and take them. Tamiya needed to play into the facade to try and get them out in the open, but now that they're on the move, he doesn't have to support it anymore. Tamiya doesn't know who shot Daigo, but he does know Kazuma, Joji Kazuma, Shintaro's brother. He became a cop and took the opposite approach that his brother did, eventually ending up in the CIA's Far East Division. Joji's only loyalty is to the CIA now, and his first order was to track Black Monday's movements. Tamiya suspects that assassinating those who wouldn't sell the land would be part of those orders, since he couldn't give up his position in the organization as it would blow his cover. For this information, Tamiya wants Kiryu to protect two men. Toma, Tamiya's former secretary who resigned after learning the truth of the bill. Toma might tell Mine of the truth behind the bill, and this might cause him to get killed. Mine is also now de facto head of the Tojo clan since Daigo is indisposed, and Mine is the only one who's trying to take the power. Tamiya ultimately wants to stop Joji from killing Toma. For Kiryu, this solves two problems, fulfilling his favor to Tamiya and protecting Morning Glory. At this point, Suzuki's personal guard arrives and Kiryu decides to clear a path so they both can leave. Kiryu tells Date to tell Majima everything if he doesn't make it out alive. We have to fight waves and waves of enemies, and Kiryu is almost about to be taken over when Majima bashes through the crowd with a dump truck, taking Kiryu out of the fray. Mine is sitting in his office, thinking back to his father's death when he was a child. He's heading back to Okinawa by plane immediately, and back at New Sedona, Kiryu and the group see Kiryu on the news. The reporters are blaming it on an anti-military group that is resisting the new bill. Kiryu decides to head to Okinawa by himself. He wants to protect Morning Glory, as that's his main objective. Majima says that he'll hold down the fort while he's gone. Back in Okinawa, Kiryu arrives at Morning Glory, receiving a warm welcome from the kids there. Nakahata is also out of the hospital and has been watching over the kids with the assistance of the Ryudo family. He brings them up to speed on everything that's going on and gets a call from Tamiya. Tamiya informs him that the prefectural assembly is meeting all day and working out the details of the resort. He's safe for now, but as soon as he leaves, Joji will be after him. For the moment, Kiryu can rest and we can deal with some orphanage drama before getting back into the thick of things. 
Before we get into that, and ultimately the finale of this story, let's talk about the music of Yakuza 3. As usual, Yakuza 3 brings in some bangers to the Hall of Fame of Yakuza songs. Fly comes in with thrumming synths that turn into beating guitar tracks. A fairly melodic and subtle banger suddenly turns into a crazy guitar ballad about halfway through with this absolutely nasty solo. I love it, and it really captures the spirit of Okinawa, in my opinion. The UQ Humming is another song that changes halfway through for me. It opens with a decent guitar that rips and a solid drum beat that keeps a steady pace, but the whole track is elevated by the vocals, covered in an ooey-gooey filter that makes it feel like you're hearing it in a particularly hazy dream. I will say though, for all of these standout songs on this entry, there are quite a few weak ones and most of the rest tend to blend together. When Kiryu gets back into things at Kamurocho, we learn that Taichi has really taken a liking to wrestling. During a match between him and Mitsuo, he gets injured. The doctor that checks him out says he has asthma that could be from his environment or trauma in his past, but regardless, he probably shouldn't be wrestling. This wrecks Taichi, as all he ever wanted to do was wrestle, but Kiryu tells him not to give up so quickly. Likia sets up a match for Taichi to watch, suggesting that he and Kiryu mask up and put on a show. The two fight and Taichi breaks in to save Kiryu and end the fight. The doctor arrives and reveals that he was wrong. Taichi doesn't have asthma, but his reaction was probably due to allergies from the soba he had earlier in the day. Later in the day, Haruka runs into Kiryu leaving for town. Kiryu thinks she's going to see a boyfriend in Ryukyu, but he quickly realizes she's taken on a job to make ends meet. After a lot of work, we find out that the job that Haruka has taken is a shady one, delivering counterfeit credit cards to people in a parking lot. She didn't realize what she was doing, and the Yakuza she was working for tricked her into it. Back at Morning Glory, Kiryu notices all of the kids asking Ayako to do things for them. Kiryu decides to prove to the children that they don't respect her or appreciate her enough. The kids all decide that they need to tell Ayako how much she is worth at the orphanage and she appreciates it. Tamiya finally calls and says that Toma's meeting is over and that he's headed to a bar called Canal Grand. Kiryu tracks him down and sees Joji going in for the kill. <laughs> ものがかりがいいらしい。兄貴と同じ血の通った俺を、お前は殴ることができるのか。さあな。だが重要なのは血じゃない。俺とおやさんは絆で繋がってる。その絆、しっかり見せてもらおうか。Kiryu stops him and this results in our battle with the man himself. He's quite the formidable opponent and we move across different parts of the club during our fight with him. He has some pretty punishing attacks that will put us on the ground if we're not careful to dodge or block them. When he's finished, he says he sees why Shintaro liked Kiryu so much and agrees to stop tracking Toma. Kiryu convinces Toma that Tamiya really sent him here to save him and he breaks down, finally deciding to switch sides and stop working for Mine. Toma heads back to see Tamiya and apologize in person for his wrongdoings. Kiryu and Joji get to have their first full conversation, and Joji explains himself. He reveals that he never intended to shoot Daigo or Nakahata. He reached into his coat pocket, and Daigo drew his gun, and his American counterpart, the Black Monday member, shot Daigo, quick on the draw. He wants to apologize to both of them, but he's not permitted to speak to civilians. He tells Kiryu that Daigo is being kept at Tauto Hospital, and Kiryu begins to head out when Taichi bursts in. He says Kiryu has to get back to morning glory. Mine arrived at the orphanage with Tamashiro, ready to destroy the place. Rikia and Mikio tried to stop them, but they were both shot. Haruka tried to protect the kids, and Mine reveals his true self. 
お前はこの施設が好きか俺はなこういう大人に守られたガキを見ると<笑>無性に腹が立ってくるんだ孤児だからって大人に守られて生きるお前らを見るとな壊してやりたくなるんだよ He orders one of his men to destroy the dog house, but Mikio steps in. Doge! He can't help it in the end, though, because the entire place is wrecked and Nakahata is taken captive. Kiryu is furious and heads back to Morning Glory. Joji offers his free transport, a private jet that he can take back to Tokyo once he's done. Mikio is taken to the hospital, and it looks like he's going to pull through. Kiryu has to head to the bull ring outside of Ryukyu, where Nakahara is being held, and Rikia wants to go. Kiryu tells him he has to stay behind as he's already injured, and he'll just be sacrificing his own life. When Kiryu arrives, Tamashiro is waiting for him, openly revealing that he's there to distract Kiryu, as Mine is already on his way to Kamurocho. Tamashiro's men drag Nakahata out and throw him into the bullpen with four bulls. Tamashiro has guns ready, and if Kiryu gets too close, he'll fire them, startling the bulls, resulting in the trampling of Nakahata. Rikia interrupts, saying Saki was trying to sneak in. Tamashiro fires his pistols and sends the bulls on a rampage. Huh? <laughs> Nakahara. Nakahara tells Kiryu not to worry about him, and we have to face waves of the Tamashiro men, and eventually, Tamashiro himself. Joji steps in at the last moment and shoots Tamashiro. Rikia is bleeding out, dying on the ground of the bullpen, and Kiryu begs him not to die. Kiryu breaks down in this moment, seeing this young prospect so full of life, wonder, dedication, and respect dead in his arms. It's incredibly heartbreaking, not only because of the man that Ikiya was, but because of how he looked up to Kiryu. It's like Batman watching Robin die. It's incredibly sad and just wrenches at the heart. Mine is on his way to Kamurocho when his subordinates are celebrating Kiryu and Daigo's downfall. Mine lashes out and stabs one of them in the hand for celebrating Daigo's death. 
Joji tells Kiryu that he has a spy plane that will get them to the hospital in an hour. He'll send for a helicopter once they've dealt with Mine and get them out of there as fast as possible. Mine is watching over Daigo as he lay unconscious, preparing for the coming onslaught. Richardson, the foreigner who leads Black Monday, is ordered to proceed as scheduled. Haruka asks Kiryu why he wanted her to come along, and she wonders if he thinks he's going to die, confronting Black Monday. Kiryu says he wanted to see the city one last time with her. They head to New Sedona, and he gives Haruka to Date. Kiryu heads to the hospital and fights his way through multiple floors of enemies. When he arrives, Daigo is gone and Richardson is there. We have to fight him in an incredibly small room. This doesn't fare too poorly, as it's pretty easy to corner him and deal with his attacks. It's also kind of odd to hear English in a Yakuza game after the original dub. If I'd known it would have come to this, I'd have killed you when first we met. In the next room, we fight off more CIA agents, but Richardson is back, forcing us to fight him another time. He uses all manner of guns and weapons at his disposal, but he's just no match for Kiryu. Kiryu makes his way to the roof and finds Mine smoking, with Daigo's body next to him. Kiryu thinks that Mine wants to kill Daigo, but that isn't true. Daigo was the only person to ever respect him. Mine was an orphan, just like Kiryu, and never really felt home anywhere. Never felt respected. When he joined the Yakuza, he was hoping to find some sort of kinship, and he did, in that of Daigo. Mine devoted his entire life to the man, and now that he's virtually dead, Mine seeks to put him out of his misery, and is again searching for that respect. Kiryu doesn't want Mine to kill Daigo, because a person that still draws breath still has meaning. Mine realizes the reason that Daigo liked him so much, his optimism. Kiryu and Mine ultimately disagree. Kiryu thinks he's just like the people he despises, only worrying about himself and not others. And Mine believes that killing Kiryu and Daigo will give his life purpose. The two realize they can't solve this with words, and some problems can only be punched. We have our final boss battle with Mine. It's quite a long one as his health bar is pretty high. He's also pretty quick, and sidestepping will usually leave us in a whirl trying to quickly identify which character is Kiryu. When Mine goes down, he gets a call from his secretary. She's talking about a stock trade, and he realizes at the end of the day, all he has left is money. Yeah. Richardson arrives at this moment and tells Mine that he has no use for any of them anymore. He decides to kill them, but at this point Daigo awakens and shoots Richardson's men, and the man himself. Stop it! Are you nuts? Kiryu-san, I wanted to meet you a little Mine! He asks if Mine was the traitor, and Kiryu says no, he would never betray Daigo. A few days later, Kiryu is saying goodbye to Yuya and Kazuki again. He's going to meet Haruka, and suddenly Hazamaki arrives, stabbing Kiryu in the stomach. His entire family has been destroyed, and he's on the run. He blames Kiryu for all of this, and Kazuki and Yuya tackle him to the ground. Haruka runs to his side, and he says he did learn something from Mine. Oh, 
The credits roll, and we say goodbye to Kiryu, bleeding out on the streets of Kamurocho. After the credits, though, we see Kiryu has survived. He's at Morning Glory, looking out at the future with Haruka and the rest of the kids. After we beat the game, we unlock Premium Adventure, which gives us the ability to run around Kamurocho and Okinawa freely, experiencing everything else that Yakuza 3 has to offer. It's about time that we get into Yakuza 3's distractions. Even though Yakuza is known for its top-notch, cinematic, and enticing main story, it's also known for its enthralling, hilarious, and addicting side content. These distractions come in all forms and provide us with tons to do around Kamurocho. The largest two minigames in Yakuza 3 are by far the ones relating to hostesses. The first being the Hostess Maker substory. This one is, as its title suggests, wrapped up in a substory. We come across a man who is the manager of the South Island Cabaret Club in Okinawa. His club isn't doing well, and his star hostess has become a little entitled. She's taking vacations and coming and going as she pleases because she knows how much she's worth. The manager wants to stick it to her and make her realize that people could come in and pass her up. This is where Kiryu comes in. He wants him to find a girl and turn her into a rank 1 hostess to prove the current rank 1 hostess wrong and get her to straighten out. There are five different women around town that we can choose from, but once we pick one, it's time to turn her into a star. The minigame is pretty simple overall. We have to orient our hostess in a specific way, upgrading her and changing her look along the way to get her to attract more customers, and know how to deal with those customers once they come. The more revenue she generates, the better. The hostess will have base stats like looks, smarts, and charisma. We can level these skills up during downtime in shifts. The hostess also has motivation and stress that has to be managed. If her stress gets too high, she'll mess up on her shift or not come into work the next day. We can give her free time during the shift to mitigate this. Changing her outfit will also increase her motivation, but will also change her appeal to the customers. During the shift, Kitty can walk the floor to see what kind of hostess the customers are interested in. He can then use this information to tailor his girl to the crowd. All that being said, this minigame is really just a junior version of what would eventually be the Cabaret Club minigame in the later entries. It's really a microcosm of that game, and just doesn't work nearly as well. It's kind of a grind overall, especially on your first hostess. It takes a while to unlock all of the training features and the outfit pieces for the girls. The whole thing just takes forever to play as well, with loading screens interrupting everything and being forced to walk the floor three times in one night. It's not too bad of an idea, but I just can't help but think that this was just the seed of the original idea and would be entirely approved upon later in the series. Speaking of hostesses, Kiryu can visit them himself if he would like. This is the other side of things and serves just as much content as the previous minigame. Kiryu can visit any of the hostess clubs in Kamurocho or Okinawa. He'll be able to request a girl and then build up a relationship with her. She'll tell him stories, provide him with interesting conversation, and at certain points will be able to interject with dialogue options. These options will determine how many hearts the hostess meter increases by. At certain points in the relationship, we can take the girl on dates to restaurants around the town, to karaoke or bowling. Eventually, the relationship will reach ahead, and we'll have a separate sub story to take on, helping the girl deal with whatever problem she has. In the case of Rin, it's an ex that's prodding into her life. This might not seem like a lot of depth for a larger minigame, but there are 10 total hostesses to spend time with, and each one can take anywhere from a half hour to an hour to get to the end of their story. Another medium-sized minigame are the Hitman missions. These start throughout the story of Yakuza 3 when we're introduced to the HLA, the Honest Living Association. This was started by Kashiwagi as a way to get Yakuza back into real work in society. Kiryu is brought on to take down hitmen and capture them, trying to bring them to reason. We can take on different jobs one at a time that will have us track down and fight a variety of different hitmen. Each of them will have their own story and unique fight mechanics that we have to deal with. Once we defeat them, they'll be taken back to the HLA, and we'll get our fee for completing the job. If we want to keep fighting, there's also always the Colosseum available to take part in. 
This is pretty similar to previous versions. We can fight different groups of enemies with different modifiers or environmental changes. The largest difference with this Colosseum is that I felt it was really grindy compared to the others. It's a lot of work to just unlock the next set of fights, and we normally have to fight the same set of enemies three or four times to unlock the next set. Leveling up Kiryu's notoriety in the Colosseum is even harder as it takes forever for that rank to go up, and the rewards that we obtain for it don't really feel worth it in the end. There's a lot of fighting to do in Yakuza 3's distractions, but most of it doesn't really make us that much stronger. Fortunately, there are a lot of separate ways in Yakuza to train. The first is Yonashiro. Throughout the story, Yonashiro appears outside Morning Glory and tells us that he wants to train Kiryu in using different weapons. We can fight him on the beach three separate times to gain certificates to buy different weapons from dealers. The battles are pretty easy and don't really provide that much challenge, and getting the weapons doesn't really feel that useful, because weapons have been seriously downgraded in this entry overall. What doesn't feel arbitrary, though, is Komaki's training. Komaki is back in this entry, of course, and he has his own dojo in the Dragon Palace, a secret building in the north side of Kamurocho. When Kiryu finds him, he knows that he's been out of training and wants him to regain his strength, so he sends him out to fight three of his former pupils that are now working day jobs. Once we find these men and take them down, we regain different moves that we learned from Komaki in the previous games. One of these moves we learn, the Tiger Drop, some would consider the most integral in the game. This lets us use a counterattack as the enemy is attacking, which causes us to rush at them doing an insane amount of damage and knocking them down. It's pretty useful if you want to breeze through the game, but it wasn't totally necessary because I didn't even get it until after I beat the main story. After fighting his pupils, Komaki agrees to teach Kiryu some new moves, and eventually we fight the master himself, learning his ultimate move in the process. Mac is also around to teach us a thing or two in this entry. We meet a foreigner throughout our adventures that teaches Kiryu about phones and the internet. He tells Kiryu to find inspiration in the world around him, and that he can take pictures of things and blog about them to figure out new moves. We can use this to find ridiculous events in the real world and watch them unfold, completing a quick time event in the process. Afterwards, we can write Kiryu's comment about it on his blog, and if we get everything right, Kiryu gets a revelation, finding a new move in the process. These are smattered all around Kamurocho and Okinawa. Each time one is unlocked, Mac will shoot us an email and give us a short description of where to find one. Mac also has decided to open up a running track in the now desolate Kamurocho Hills, teaching Kiryu how to run faster and tackle harder. Each of his courses that we complete will get a small upgrade to our chasing mini game, beating his best time will afford us a new weapon or item. The last thing we can do to increase our battle prowess is take part in the IF7. This is a virtual reality game that acts as a sequel to the one that we could play in the original Yakuza 2, cut from the Kiwami remake. Mina Mida, the mad scientist resembling Doc Brown, will transport us into the virtual reality world and have us fight bosses that we've previously went up against. This time, we can't use heat actions though, and our health bar is replaced with our heat bar. For winning these fights, sometimes we'll receive weapons, and sometimes we'll even get new combat abilities. After a long day of fighting enemies and training to fight more enemies, it might be time to take a load off though with a nice massage. A very short but interesting minigame has Kiryu heading to a massage parlor where he can receive two different types of massages. He has to keep his mind on relaxation while he's there though, and to do this we have to control a meter. This thing will move up or down independent of us, and we have to tap buttons to keep it in the center. The weight of these buttons changes throughout the session, and keeping it higher on the meter will increase our score, but also put us in more danger of becoming unrelaxed. It's an interesting little side venture that only took about two minutes or so to perfect, but was fun overall, and the game over screens were just as outlandish and enjoyable. 
Outside of these few minigames, there are all manner of repeat and new small minigames. Darts, pool, bowling, koi koi, poker, roulette, batting, boxelios, karaoke, UFO catchers, and more. There's no shortage of ways to waste the day away around Kamarocho or Okinawa. But of course, the cream of the crop as far as minigames go is always the sub-stories. These are small side quests that we can participate in outside of the main story. They're short, sweet, and usually either hilarious or dark. One of the larger ones that Yakuza 3 presents takes place across seven different sub-stories that are all connected, sort of. These are the seven mysteries of Okinawa. In Ryukyu, we'll see a group of three girls walking around the city talking about the seven mysteries of Okinawa, different unexplainable occurrences across town. Each of them end up being explained by some real-world occurrence, like men drugging women and taking them back to an apartment, a ghost of a girl by the coin lockers being explained by men selling burner phones kept in those lockers, and some discontinued magical fruit juice that was actually just a healthy drink that was around when healthy drinks weren't popular yet. The final substory results in Kiryu becoming the seventh mystery of Okinawa after he takes care of some men who are extorting people across the city for damaging their cars. There's a pretty funny substory that sees Kiryu learning English from a woman selling handbooks on the street. Each time he learns some new phrases, he meets a woman on the street that he tries them out on. Eventually, it seems like she has the hots for him and she takes him back home. We realize pretty quickly, though, that this is a scam set up to get men to buy the extra English courses, and Kiryu has to beat up some thugs before he can leave. One substory sees us having to balance ice cream to help a father deliver the sweet treat to his family. I just thought seeing Kiryu carry ice cream piled high was pretty funny. There's one substory that dwarfs them all, though, and that's the murder at Cafe Alps. This is one of the longest substories I've seen overall. We find a woman who is accusing a journalist of writing a story about her brother who was falsely accused of murder years ago at Cafe Alps. We learn the details of the case from him, and he thinks that the wrong man was convicted. We have to go around interviewing multiple people and getting their testimonies, basically playing Danganronpa Mini. We eventually get all of the evidence for the crime and have to present it in front of all of those who were involved. We find out that someone else committed the murder and have to prove it with the evidence collected. It's an incredibly detailed story with diagrams, profiles, case facts, tons of dialogue, and full cutscenes. It's kind of nuts, and the further I got in the story, the more impressed I was with how well they delivered this murder mystery narrative. It also seemed like it was kind of a precursor to the actual detective games that the RGG team would eventually create. Yakuza 3's side content is an interesting evolution from the first and second games in the series. There's a lot of compelling stuff here. The minigames and stories that are told are fun and time-consuming, but I don't think they really live up to the later entries. And the team was still figuring out what they wanted this side content to be and were fleshing it all out. Yakuza 3 overall is a great entry in the series. It's definitely not one of the best in my opinion, but it does some really important things for the series overall. The story itself is kind of odd and can get pretty confusing during the later third. It can be kind of difficult to follow and gets all wrapped up in politics and subverting expectations. I honestly felt like the most interesting parts of the story were when Kiryu was dealing with the orphanage. There's definitely some high points to the story that don't have to deal with Morning Glory, though. The bullring section of the game is incredibly well done, and seeing Rikia die was particularly rough. Speaking of Rikia, he's probably one of the most interesting characters in the first three games. He's a young, headstrong kid that respects Kiryu more than he knows. He wants to help in any way he can, he wants to do what's right, and he eventually throws away his life to complete that mission. It's rough to see, and it's hard to watch its effect on Kiryu. Okinawa as a setting is also fantastic. It's a calm, relaxing place that feels full of a new culture. Played against Kamurocho, it has that small town feel to it. It's a wonderful city and feels like a new direction rather than just another big Japanese mecca. 
The gameplay definitely has its weaknesses, and it can be a little awkward to use, but it's gotten a little too much hate for sure. When looking at the boss designs, it's clear the developers crafted the system around being more technical, which is a reflection of where Kiryu is at this point in his life. He's dealing with kids, he has a family now, and he doesn't want to go head first into battle. He just can't punch through everyone's guard and smash them down. He has to be conservative and fight wisely. All that being said, even the worst of the Yakuza games are still a great time. Yakuza 3 fits this bill. It isn't the best in the series, but it's still a fantastic game and a great title. Yakuza 3 was released to critical success again, getting awards from multiple publications. It was the second best-selling PlayStation 3 game of 2009 in Japan. By December 7th, 2009, it had sold almost 500,000 copies. With this success, Sega and RGG decided to jump right back in and start development on the fourth entry in the series.